Hi everyone, uh, my name is Tony. Welcome to our channel again. Uh, today we are in London and we have a very interesting guest whose name is Mauricio Magalji. Uh, he's the expert in blockchain and uh, we're going to talk about his background more. Let's start. Yep. Thanks for having me. Meet Mauricio Magaldi, blockchain catalyst for multiple industries, experienced business transformation leader and the crypto strategy director at 11FS, a leading UK-based financial consulting firm. Their track record has created 15 fintechs and 12 neobanks. Mauricio joined the team a year ago and has been taking the crypto world by storm ever since. And not only crypto, but music too. Can you educate a bit our audience about this thing that we have, let's say, it's called usually three uh, three generations of blockchain that you right. have. Okay. You have Bitcoin, this number one, yeah. then you have Ethereum, this number two, and now you have number three, which is like Solana, Cardano, et cetera. Um, where is it going? What are the differences and uh, why it's important to divide into these three? Right. Yeah. So I'm not I'm not a I'm not a historian. Yeah, but I, 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 <laughs> it's already I, uh, history. Yeah, yeah, it's already history. <laughs> um, but yeah, Bitcoin is like the first generation of blockchain. So yeah. it's uh, basically it serves one use case, mm -hmm. and as it evolves, we're seeing other use cases. But yeah. the one use case is peer-to-peer -peer payments across yeah. the internet, right? And the one thing that was resolved by the Bitcoin generation of blockchains mm -hmm. is the double spend problem. Right before Bitcoin or before the blockchain, I could send you a file mm -hmm. and you get a copy of a file. Right. Right. It, at that point, we have two files. You have a one. file and I have I a have file. one. You have another. Yeah. Well, that's twice as many files that yeah. we need in the internet. Right? Yeah. If you do that with money, you create an inflationary form of money because every time you move money, there's more money. Right. So that's why until we had Bitcoin, we had the double spend problem because everything was copy and paste on the internet. Mm -hmm. That is why music lost complete value because the, by the time we had digital music, I could send music and copies of music files everywhere. Yeah, and I don't pay for this anymore. IP right? rights do not matter anymore. That's why we emptied out the whole value of music, yeah. you know, the first stage of the internet. So Bitcoin solves that because when I send you a Bitcoin, you get you a, don't Bitcoin. Have a Bitcoin, I don't have a Bitcoin yeah. anymore. So that's solved, but that's one use case. So when Ethereum came about, um, and, and was conceived to be the uh, com internet computer. Yeah. Um, that was, I, I can now program a blockchain. And with that, I can now program money. Mm -hmm. So that is the second generation, as you say, uh, where I can now write business rules that tell the internet what to do when whatever event happens. It's called smart contract. It was the uh, introduction yeah. of smart contracts, yeah. which is not... Um, to be honest, is not uh, something that Ethereum invented, yeah. but for sure Ethereum made popular because mm -hmm. that's how Ethereum was conceived to enable that programmability. And then you have what you call the third generation, which is uh, the more of uh, uh, Solana, Cardano, uh, Polkadot, mm -hmm. um, Algorand, Near, all of those mm -hmm. uh, other uh, blockchains. They are still programmable, uh, but some of them have modular um, architecture. So if you get Polkadot, for instance, mm -hmm. you have a layer zero, which is the Polkadot concept mm -hmm. architecture, mm -hmm. and you have parachains that are blockchains that run uh, in conjunction with the rest of the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. uh, you have also the Cosmos um, ecosystem that is uh, based on the interoperable blockchain, IBC, mm -hmm. where you have assets in a uh, Cosmos um, they, I think they're called app chain. Mm -hmm. uh, and that asset can be acknowledged by blockchains or applications running in other blockchains of the same ecosystem. So you have mm -hmm. more of a fractal mm -hmm. kind of construct uh, across uh, the whole ecosystem. Solana is a little bit different, although it's a third generation, it's more of a monolithic architecture. Maybe that's why they're uh, running into... For me, they look almost the same as Ethereum, like uh, Solana. Oh, the, the off, the, the, if you think about the features, yeah. they all mimic somehow the features that uh, Ethereum offer. Yeah. But all of them have different uh, technical mm. specs that are different, that mm. are either uh, a little less decentralized, mm -hmm. uh, a little more secure, 
uh, scale a little bit mm -hmm. a little bit better because mm -hmm. all of them are trying to solve what Vitalik called the um, the blockchain trilemma, right? Is the dilemma in three parts yeah. between decentralization, security, and scalability, mm -hmm. right? So you can have two of them, but you can't. Ha you cannot have three of them. That's why it's a trilemma, right? That's really cool. Cool <laughs> idea. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. It's it, and it's a concept that. Uh, all of these other uh, layer one blockchains have been trying to solve in their own technical ways. Mm -hmm. That's why we keep hearing about more Ethereum killers all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's, right? that's, that's a because big point. Because everyone is trying yeah. to figure out a way to solve the trilemma that Ethereum is gradually solving with yeah. layer twos and ZK proofs and yeah. all of that stuff, uh, sharding and the future roadmap. Um, in an, in other technical ways, right? mm -hmm. I'm 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 a, I'm a very non-practicing engineer, mm -hmm. and from what I understand is that do we need other blockchains? Maybe That's, not. Yeah. Maybe not. But if we are to solve the trilemma, we'll need to experiment with the technology as much as we can to actually go and find a way that is very decentralized, mm -hmm. very secure, and can scale. But still, we have uh, we have Ethereum, which is second generation, kind of like outdated already to a certain extent. But I, I wouldn't say outdated because you have constant innovation being pushed into Ethereum on a regular basis. I'll give you an example. Two three weeks ago, we had uh, the introduction of a new standard on Ethereum mm -hmm. called account abstraction. Okay. So in Ethereum, you have to have a wallet. Mm -hmm. your, your wallet is your identity and how you control the keys to your assets. That yeah, I have I have MetaMask. On the, yeah. That is that is one example, but that's a user wallet, right? So for you to use anything or any DApp on, on on that wallet, you have to approve a bunch of transactions. If you lose your seed phrase, you lose yeah. the access to your assets. <laughs> it's my so, huge nightmare. <laughs> exactly. So it's not exactly user friendly. Now with the new ERC four three three seven, it's possible that you can write a smart contract mm -hmm. that can play the role of a user wallet. That's why it's called account abstraction. You okay. can create a lot of new UX, new user experience uh -huh. that facilitates you as a user to manage your own assets that live on the blockchain. So what can I do with it? That is innovation. You can have uh, two-factor authentication that mm. doesn't rely on your uh, seed phrase, for instance. Mm. Mm -hmm. You can have social recovery of your passphrase if you lose it. You can have sponsored gas fees. Oh, that's really important. Uh, and, and, you can have this <laughs> and you can have bundling of transactions that make it cheaper for you to actually push out uh, a transaction into the blockchain. And you can control that with the smart contract. So these mm -hmm. things are coming on a constant flow. And this is true for uh, Bitcoin. There's the BIP, the Bitcoin, mm -hmm. um, Bitcoin Innovation Proposal, I think it's uh -huh. called. There is the, the, the EIP, which is the same for Ethereum. Mm -hmm. All of the other blockchains have governance and most of them are open source. So developers all over the world are continuously proposing new features and implementing new features for every blockchain. The reason why we feel that, that Ethereum is maybe becoming outdated mm -hmm. is because this is the most stable we have right now. Yeah, it's use. just like, an, it's, it's a normal, like you had to have something exactly. on Ethereum. And the thing I like the most about the older generations like Bitcoin mm -hmm. and, and Ethereum uh, blockchains is that these are all infrastructure. Mm -hmm. the, the, the fact that we're here talking about them is like if we were in 1993 talking about TCP IP. Yeah. <laughs> right? I hope one day I don't have to talk about blockchains anymore and we're just talking about how we build new businesses. Mm -hmm. right? And it doesn't matter if it's blockchain A, B, or C because we're just building the businesses, right? So I feel, uh, and I've been into this since, I don't know, professionally since 2017. And it's, you know, I really want to talk about something else at some point. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so basically, um, uh, this is a very abstract idea of uh, dividing these uh, blockchains into generations because those that are earlier ones, they are also developing the same way. Yeah, it's not like they, they've been static. Um, mm -hmm. we, uh, a year ago, we had Taproot, which is a, an upgrade on the Bitcoin uh, blockchain that enabled what we are now calling Bitcoin NFTs. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there is innovation. It's just not, you don't want to be touching infrastructure all the time, right? You, you have to have a solid basis to build upon. If, you, if you're all the time changing infrastructure, then it's an application. 
it's not an infrastructure. What do you think about the uh, the, the prospects of these uh, uh, tokens, such as Solana, for example, and uh, Algorand, etc.? Because people people are thinking about them as also as a matter of uh, investment, and uh, and the the price for Solana is just going up and down all the time. Uh, it's uh, it's not very stable. Um, so, like, what's what are the prospects of this these tokens, or or we, we shouldn't think about this uh, really? So, I'm I'm not a trader. Yeah, right. I, I'm barely an engineer. So, I'm not a trader either. Yeah. Yeah. So, I I can't I can't give you uh, yeah. investment advice, but I, I would offer a way to think about them mm -hmm. that might be unconventional. So, okay. if you, if you go to Google or IBM or AWS. And you want to buy infrastructure mm -hmm. to run your your business? Mm -hmm. Well, they'll give you a price. Mm -hmm. The reason why that's static and stable is because they are giving you the price. You're taking that on your own, right? So there's no market for that. You don't go and say, "I want to buy Google," and then 17 people come to you and say, "I'll charge you 10, I'll charge you 12, I'll charge you 15." There's no uh, auction for right. that. When you go to public blockchains, it's the opposite. The market is telling you how much you can pay for using that infrastructure. So it's the first time in the history of technology you have real-time pricing to use an infrastructure. And as with everything that has variable pricing, there is speculation. Right. So I would think about those native cryptocurrencies as means to access an infrastructure. Gas fees and all of that stuff, right? Yeah, gas fees, yeah. So if you look to that that way, then you start to understand that if you want to use that infrastructure, then you gradually have to buy yourself into that infrastructure. That's why you buy a native cryptocurrency. That's, for example, I had this problem just like a week ago when, when uh, this problem with uh, uh, huge banks like uh, Silicon Valley Bank, uh, Happened in the circle, uh, unpacked from from the U.S. dollar. Yep. It was a cra crazy situation, and so I was I was looking what to do, and I changed my USDCs into USDTs, and for that I needed I needed uh, uh, gas fees, obviously. So I I borrowed some some ethers from my friends. It was a crazy story, really. Have you have you had some, some problems with that also? No, um, no, I I do have uh, some USDC mm. and. Um, I understood that it would repag, mm -hmm. so I didn't do anything. Um, <laughs> and you were again smart not enough. not not financial advice, yeah, but yeah. I do have friends that realized that if they went and bought USDC at mm -hmm. 80 percent, uh, 80 80 percent of the peg, yeah, when it recovered, they would get like that 20 cents on the dollar, uh -huh. um, you know, back. Yeah. So they went on and they they sold USDT and bought USDC. What do you think? I'm, I don't I don't have the guts to do that. Yeah. But uh, yeah, more power to you, friends. Yeah, I mean, I, I lost I lost this twenty percent, but okay, I mean, uh, that happens. Um, <laughs> but I, I mean, I, I was very nervous because obviously it looked as if uh, it was as spooky as if as if as if uh, we we had the situation with UST uh, a bit before when everything well, but, just crashed. But again, that's 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 why it's important to understand yeah. the underlying technology. UST was an algorithmic stablecoin. Yeah. The peg was dynamic. Dynamic, yeah. Based on an, an, a, a peer token that was issued by the same entity. Yeah. So maintaining the peg in an upward market, it's easy. Maintaining a peg on a down market is much, much harder. Of course. Right? If you're an algorithmic stablecoin. Yeah. So USDC isn't an algorithmic stablecoin. It's, it's the, probably the most conservative form of stablecoin, which is the collateralized stablecoin on so they have, they have huge securities. huge amount of dollars yeah. and so they they have them and that, that yeah. that's how you how you maintain yeah. the, the yeah. price so if I want to issue one token that's worth like one dollar then I have to have one dollar in my pocket but it's, it's they it's, had dollars yeah. on the SVV pocket that's but uh, uh, th this is what they say right it's, well it's, they're 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 constantly audited um, mm -hmm. USDC has uh, uh, it's a very circle has a very uh, transparent reputation. Mm -hmm. uh, even throughout the weekend, 
uh, Jeremy and, and Dante from uh, Circle went public and had a, like a live video mm -hmm. and, and issued uh, statements across uh, the markets. Um, yeah, so it was kind of the 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 deep hagging in that weekend was kind of probably like a consequence of being overly transparent, I guess. Ah, so they they could say we are pegged still and everything yeah, is fine. They said yes, we have. Uh -huh. uh, Balances. We have shortage of. We have balances in, yeah. in the SVB. Yeah. This is the amount we have there. And if you and if you uh, pay attention to the numbers, mm -hmm. um, the deep pegging was almost exact. The deep pegging of the amount corresponding to the SVB. So this is like absolute. Yeah. It's uh, it's it's openness. Yeah, it's it's probably the the dire consequence of being overly transparent. Yeah, that that's interesting thing. So we can really rely on on the USDC. Well, that's the <laughs> I, I I think we can all. I mean, trust but verify, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, 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 so all the time. So I think yeah, for for the time being, yes. But again, I think we do need um, the global markets to rally together and define a uh, regulatory framework for stable coins in general. What do you think? What happened with uh, SVB and uh, Signature Bank and? Um, and Silvergate. We have three banks that were basically working with crypto in the U.S. and basically were some kind of a gate for um, for crypto money um, to 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 cooperate and to kind of like participate in the U.S. economy, right? And then they just crashed, and they crashed. Why? Uh, so SVB crashed because because um, the uh, Federal Reserve just uh, changed the, the the interest rate, and they had a lot of uh, in investments in the long uh, treasuries, and so they just they just crashed, and it looked as if as if somebody just thought that we need to we we the the, the US we need to stop having this uh, this uh, communication between the US economy and crypto uh, that these banks have represented, and since that they had this this. Uh, the weak weak side, they just used this weak side um, and 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 crash the banks. What do you think about this, or is it just the key went on? <laughs> no, no I, th I think I mean um, banks um, collapsing are very similar to planes crashing, right? There's no one cause, yeah, right? Yeah. So Serial I, I think that, and I'm not private to any information on those yeah. banks, but I think um, the regulators were cornered. Mm -hmm because of the, the whole interest rate and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and many things came to factor in mm -hmm. to actually intervene at, at SVB um, and, and in Signature. It, it might, if you're a, a crypto purist, it might sound like, well, these guys are coming after mm -hmm. crypto. I wouldn't say that they are mm -hmm. or they are not. I would say that if you pick the pieces you want, you can assemble any conspiracy you can think of, right? So I think um, we need to give some more time for more information to mm. be made available for us to do any type of uh, inference. Uh, what I will say is that this isn't good for anyone. Right? It's, just, it's not good for the regulators, it's not good for the US economy, it's not good for crypto. Mm -hmm. So how if, if something really bad at that scale happens and mm. it's not good for anybody, who's actually benefiting from it, right? So I think that's kind of my kind of, you mm. know, middle of the road um, kind of thinking because mm. it's, if, you, if you're a crypto purist, you're going to say, oh, they're coming after crypto. They're shutting down all crypto-friendly banks. Mm -hmm. They're trying to avoid crypto, you know, getting mm -hmm. into the economy. And now you have um, guys like Balaji saying, well, this is going to hyperinflate. The dollar is going to fumble mm -hmm. by Bitcoin, right? So, And bit Bitcoin is getting uh, more and more expensive, in fact. Yeah. But you know, is it is it because of Balaji? Is it because of the banks? Is it because there is now more money into the U.S. economy because of the rescue plan, mm -hmm. and now people have access to those deposits? So instead of just sitting on those deposits, they're going to pull it out and buy Bitcoin. You know, it's that that's what happened with the SVB. As far as I understand, that they had a lot of cash and they didn't know what to do with with them, and so they they invested into these long uh, treasuries because they were yeah, more. Yeah, but, but again, it's not just that, right? <laughs> yeah. There's there's uh, there's other factors, and mm -hmm. I'm just saying about mm -hmm. SVB particularly that you know conflated, and then you know mm -hmm. the mix of those factors kind of put them in a position that they couldn't manage. The interest and the and the tenors and the, and the and the and the 
in the security. I, I, I know I know of people uh, that have this problem that, uh, okay, so now we don't have SVB, we don't have Signature Bank, we don't have uh, Silvergate. W what kind of banks can we use? Because that's obviously a huge problem. There should be some, uh, some, some infrastructure that would connect the US dollar to 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 be to bitcoins and other other cryptos. So what what would you suggest? So I uh, I'm not going to suggest anything, but mm -hmm. I'm going to comment on on one thing that I read from um, an analyst at J.P. Morgan, and I'm, and I'm not sure if it was Jamie Dimon that said mm -hmm. this, mm -hmm. um, but someone in J.P. Morgan came uh, yesterday mm -hmm. and said that there might be a space for the large crypto exchanges to actually play that part now that they don't have banks that are crypto friendly. So, but th th then they need they need some kind of a license for yeah. that. It, it's not the, that easy. Yeah. yeah, but they know but they know the, the 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 hard part of the infrastructure, right? If you have the custodians like Coinbase custody and Binance custody and uh, Kraken and Crypto.com and Blockchain.com. Oh, uh, Coinbase is a good idea because Coinbase is is based in the U.S. Yeah. and they probably have some kind of um, payment institutions or whatever they have uh, for. Yeah. So, for instance, in Brazil, um, the crypto exchanges uh, are working with the central bank to have payment institution licenses. That solves itself. Right. right? That should work, you know, serve as inspiration for the U.S. regulator to actually enable that. Because mm -hmm. one thing that they can't do, is like mm -hmm. uh, Coinbase is a listed company. It's a public company listed yeah, in, the, it's a, yeah. in, the, in the stock exchange. Mm -hmm. So, if you're creating a situation where one of your largest players in the market that is listed cannot operate in a country, what do you think is going to happen with the, one, the stock price of that particular yeah, company? Yeah, for sure. And two, you create an incentive for them to flee the country and find somewhere else, which might be a, you know, a major jurisdiction like the UK or Europe, but could be like a minor jurisdiction with less controls. Bahamas. Do you, do you really, <laughs> do you really want to enable that as, as one of the biggest economies in the world, right? In fact, the matter is, if you think about it, dollar stable coins are great for the U.S. economy. Why would you fight that? Well, because as as far again, I I I I, I, I uh, listened to the congressional hearings related to um, to FTX, and many uh, uh, members of Congress, congressmen, they were saying like, we need to do something with this. We don't we don't need this anymore in our economy. This is a huge disaster. We don't need. Like these children to to manage big things like uh, oh, but, but, finance. But, but this was my uh, let let, let them de develop games. <laughs> yeah, but better. This small group of grossly inexperienced, non-sophisticated individuals who failed to implement virtually any of the systems or controls. This is my concern when FTX happened. Is mm -hmm. like this is the one opportunity we need to educate legislators and even broadcasters. That's mm -hmm. what happened with FTX is the old recipe in the fraud book. It has nothing to do with crypto. Yes, exactly. Crypto was the one asset class they chose to leverage for their malpractices, but they were not using blockchain to do anything. They, they just were just operating, money. Yeah. They're operating the assets on their infrastructure. Yeah. Right? They used QuickBooks for accounting. Yeah, right? it was so, funny, funny part. Right, so. <laughs> using QuickBooks. QuickBooks? QuickBooks. Uh, nothing against QuickBooks, very nice tool, just not for a multi-billion dollar company. If you really want to dive deep into the problem, the problem is, was not crypto. The problem was a poor corporate governance that was designed to commit fraud. It has nothing to do with technology, it has nothing to do with digital assets, and this was my one concern, like if we don't do this post-mortem well, yeah. Like everyone's going to think that, oh, this was a crypto failure when it wasn't really, right? You are doing financial services strategy. What do you think would be the most interesting, uh, let's say, um, areas where to explore? For example, let's say we are going, we are going to have open banking uh, mm -hmm. institutions. Open finance, yeah. yeah. Open, open, fi open banking. It's yeah. open banking API, right? Yeah. In Europe. Uh, because we have PSD2, PSD2 is gradually working with uh, with banks. So they are opening their APIs. The same hap happening here in the UK. The same is happening in Brazil, for yep. example, in the US. Where is it going? So this is a traditional part of, uh, yep. of, of finance. 
then we have the developments in blockchain. So where do you think there will be the in the most interesting points of intersections or um, uh, we're, uh, we're seeing a lot of activity in tokenization, a lot. Um, that's probably the gateway entry uh, between traditional financial institutions and the world of open permissionless blockchains mm -hmm. is tokenizing assets in general. Mm -hmm. um, because traditional firms are already custodians of most of the traditional assets. Mm -hmm. right? The fact that they are trading those assets in self-contained, uh, obscure, isolated systems is also a burden to them in terms of maintaining those systems and mm -hmm. being able to trade openly those assets. Mm -hmm. When you tokenize what we call real world assets, we shouldn't even call them real world assets, but crypto mm -hmm. people call it real world assets. Uh, when we tokenize them, we put them on chain, we create a market with additional liquidity. Yeah. You disintermediate a number of processes you might have to control and register and check the status. And now, now you have something that is open, everyone sees what's going on, the prices are public, and you have not only more transparency, but you also have more liquidity, right? In Brazil, we're seeing uh, at least five large-scale projects with real estate tokenization. Mm -hmm. um, there's uh, projects uh, in the US and in Africa for carbon credit tokens. Carbon? Credit. Carbon credit? Yeah. So it's for carbon, but it's credit, credit tokens. No, carbon credits. The, the offset, carbon offsets. Aha, uh -huh, okay. Uh -huh. So uh, you have that. Uh, there's studies on uh, still private permission blockchains, but for tokenized bonds and mm -hmm. securities, uh, stocks in general, mm -hmm. uh, and even uh, public uh, bonds being issued on chain. Traditional pro financial products there it is. that are now finding their ways into um, the world of blockchain. So I think that is probably where we're seeing most activity. I'm still uh, of the opinion that we should be trying to build those things into what I call public goods uh, mm -hmm. infrastructure, like public open blockchains, because mm -hmm. I feel that not only it gives us uh, a little bit better, uh, a little bit better cost uh, structure, because most of the stuff is uh, variable cost, but also more transparency in, in global reach by the time you're tokenizing uh, any asset in a public uh, permissionless blockchain, you have the global markets at your disposal. We're also seeing a number of jurisdictions uh, investing public money into metaverses, mm -hmm. right? Colombia had the first trial in the metaverse. Yeah. Um, <laughs> super curious about that. <laughs> uh, Korea is, uh, you know, as an as a, as a, uh, education heavy country is, is leveraging the metaverse for uh, educational purposes. So I feel that there will be regulation that is gonna touch like identity management yeah. in the metaverse. Like mm -hmm. how do I know that Tony, the Tony I'm talking in the metaverse yeah. is the Tony that I talk to yeah. you know, uh, on the real world. So how, how do I actually uh, ensure that these things are being traced in the right way without becoming overpowering to the uh, individuality and privacy of the users? Right now we're in this space where we need to balance what is public and what is private in ways that what is public of public interest yeah. is public for people to see, but whatever is private is obviously kept uh, in the hands of the individual. So we're in a very particular uh, space in the industry. And, and I think to that end, what we're seeing with the zero knowledge uh, proofs and rollups, uh, you know, is one of the ways that we're going to uh, have to manage uh, maybe identity, but for sure privacy in the world of blockchains. It, about metaverse, it's just interesting when we had a recent scandal uh, with uh, FTX, one of the things that have been touched upon in the uh, congressional hearings when uh, the, uh, the trustee, uh, what's his name, uh, this guy, um, John, John Ray, I guess that's that's his John name. John Ray the third. Yeah. Yeah, the third. Yeah, yeah. He was one of the things he was saying. They they were using they were using FTX. Were using uh, an audit firm which had uh, like uh, an office in uh, in Metaverse, and he was like laughing about that. It, it's I, I I cannot I cannot trust the uh, the the documents that have been issued by this firm. <laughs> I have never heard about I, it. I I think. 
there were worse things than having an office in the metaverse in that particular yeah. <laughs> case, but yeah. I'm going to just not comment on it. <laughs> yeah, meta metaverse is still like, you know, the definition is still up for grabs. Um, because I come from financial services, mm -hmm. I see this as another um, engagement point with users. Mm -hmm. So I tend to think of it as, the, you know, if you have a, a mobile app and a, and a website on a desktop, why not have a point of engagement with your users on the metaverse as well? Uh, be it your B2B users, be your B2C users, uh, what is the type of experience you... And again, to, to my earlier point, uh, as we do with everything at, at 11FS, is what problems are you mm -hmm. solving? Do you need the metaverse at all? Well, if your clients are trying to do stuff in the metaverse, then maybe you, you, have, a, you have to have a presence there but for sure is not a branch. <laughs> and and obviously, like, okay, uh, like 20 years ago, um, the website was the same thing as, as right now, Metaverse, Office, or whatever yeah. it is. For you, how, how, do you, how do you define Web3? And is it just a catchword, catchphrase or something? Uh, <laughs> or it has some, some, some validity. <laughs> no, it <laughs> does. Uh, we, we wrote a report last year called uh, uh, How Web3 is Shaping the Future of Finance. And uh, to me uh, and, 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 and to our, uh, our team there at 11FS, Web3 is crypto's glow up. Right, nobody wants to touch crypto. These are all toxic assets. Oh my God, yeah. exotic, you know, um, this dark web. You know, there's a whole, you know, negative vibe around the world uh, crypto. But Web three is a little bit more um, fun, a little bit more. Oh, it's there's like games involved, and you're talking about digital assets. You're mm -hmm. talking about uh, composability. You're talking about you know all of the good things you can build mm -hmm. with the technology. So I feel that crypto is more tied to trading and speculation, mm -hmm. and Web3 is more tied to how do we build a new internet of ownership with, the, uh, with these uh, technology primitives. So yeah, Web3, uh, you know, in my mind, is, uh, is a builder's ecosystem. It's not a trader's ecosystem. Crypto sounds much more like a trader's ecosystem. Yes. Which is not basically. Uh, I, I I read, for example, a, a very interest. I mean, it's it's not a very. It's just like uh, everyone, ever everyone, everyone should 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 read this uh, the, the article uh, by Vitalik Buterin about the um, Web three and um, soul tokens. Soul bound tokens. Soul bound bound, bound to tokens. Yes. So kind of like a reputation that you can tokenize something like that. The yeah. idea. Well, the idea is that mm -hmm. you can manage identity. Uh, in ways that are tied to your Ethereum address, so right. you can build uh, your credentials. You can, you know, your your the courses you took in college, the the grades you had in school, the work you've delivered for a DAO. Yeah, you know, the lectures or the interviews you gave. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, all of that could be uh, uh, accretive to your profile and cumulative uh, to your soul. <laughs> if you if you use that uh, kind of construct, it's a non-transferable NFT. Right. So uh, f uh, I mean, it's a huge problem, really. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I know it because I, I am a chief legal officer in the company, and I know that's one of the things is that you, you get you get a lot of um, let's say um, the CVs, for example. You never know. Like, is it true or false? Like, you have a person. <laughs> oh, if you go to LinkedIn and you yeah. scan your network, yeah. How many people do you actually know, and how many many people you actually know have gone through all of those companies and did exactly what they, you know, they're exactly. saying. Exactly. That, that, right? That's the problem. That is a problem for sure. Yeah. For sure. So if you get, if you get, uh, we call it on-chain credentials, right? Um, it would be um, really uh, interesting if we could leverage that type of technology to expedite, say, employee onboarding or hiring processes yes, and yes. all of that stuff, right? There's one company here in the UK that use uh, they're specialized in background check. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, they're, they're, uh, they're called people check. People and check. Uh, mm -hmm. if you are a trader or if you mm -hmm. work on a trading floor um, in financial services, you have to have a number of certificates. Yeah. And you have to have grades of those certificates, and they those certificates they expire. Yeah. So whenever a financial services company is hiring a trader, they need to go through this background check. Now, they built their system on top of blockchain. So every time they do a, a, a background check, they register that on 
the blockchain and they give the key to the user. Mm -hmm. So the next time this user is hired by another company, they'll give access to the company and say, well, okay, so you, you've done this mm -hmm. until the last employment. Yeah. Now we're going to do the background check for the accretive side. Because you yeah. don't have to redo the whole thing if you have a immutable source of information that's reliable. So right? you, so this, this, this guy is like a slave for this company, for the health, for the whole of his year. <laughs> it's not a slave, <laughs> but it's, it's a service, right? Yeah. And, and it's the service is uh, contracted by the employer, mm -hmm. not the employee. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. everyone kind of, you know, adds on to this and it, it becomes this like decentralized source of truth. Right, so the, this, this type of a people check, right? It's kind of like... Uh, an implementation of what Vitalik, for example, has, uh, was talking yeah, about. Yeah, it's not exactly the same because it's not a um, non-transferable NFT. They, they were operating in blockchain much before that. Um, but the, conceptually, the, the result is the same, right? You have on-chain credentials that anyone can, can verify. Right, right. Uh, another example is um, uh, in, in Ethereum, um, there is a, an, an idea of signed verified signature, yep. a signed verified message, right? Uh, which is basically a transaction that you are doing on your uh, wallet. And by this transaction, for example, you can attest that you, you as a person with this name uh, and this, let's say, date of birth and uh, an ID number, uh, you own this wallet. Like that, that is the 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 sign. The sign message is more like I'm 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 sending something that is me that's sending. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That that's the whole idea. So with this thing, you can actually um, do uh, uh, basically proof of proof of source of funds. Like uh, yeah, you... I mean more importantly, right? With with the whole construct of blockchains, because you can now trace where funds move from one point to another, you have the whole history of wallets. Yes. On chain that you can verify. Yes, but you, you, you but uh, these 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 wallets they do not hold your name, so you need to. Oh, put, they're all pseudonymous for sure. Yeah, so so you need to put your name uh, in some kind of signed verified yeah. signature. You could. Yeah, you, could. you don't have to, but you could. And that that's a good thing because like uh, the, the, the the good good, uh, good good question because I have friends of mine, for example, and, and colleagues, uh, and they are they are having this dilemma. On one side, for example, let's say a person has um, two mil two million dollars on his uh, on his wallet in Ethereum. Uh, he, on one side, it's a good idea to to issue this uh, signed verified message because then you can attest that this wallet is, is is your wallet, and so then you can demonstrate it to a bank or something like that that you have this this wealth, mm -hmm. right? On another side, it's kind of like a spooky thing, like you like uh, showing that you have this amount of money, well, and this then is... you're associating on-chain data with off-chain data. Yes, and that is where zk's come in. So okay. Zero knowledge. Uh, I was explaining zero knowledge in a very uh, easy way, and I hope I'm not butchering this. Uh, mm -hmm. So, cryptographers there, pardon. Mm -hmm. um, so, zero knowledge is I'll give you an information that you know it's true, without me having to give you the data. Right. You just you just provide some. So cred it's called cre it, credential. Yeah. yeah. But but in in, in that example, yeah. so if you are, if you're trying to prove to a bank that you have two million on on a wallet. Yeah. So if you do the sign verify, what yeah. you're doing is that you're giving an association between your name yeah. and that amount yeah. or that wallet to a third party. Yes. With ZK, you don't need to do that. Mm -hmm. What you need is respond a question from, from the query mm -hmm. that says, does Stony have over $2 million? Yeah. And the answer, and the answer will is be yes. yes or no. Yeah. You don't have to show how much you have. Yeah. If you're Tony, if that wallet is Tony's, yes. nothing. The only answer you, 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 the, the blockchain or the ZK proof is going to give back is yes or no. So this is a um, cryptography construct that will enable us to have public data infrastructure, but private data knowledge. <laughs> it's mind blowing. It's mind blowing, and and that's why we're seeing the emergence of so many ZK uh, projects this year. I mean, ZK Sync just announced a new uh, ZK which, VM which, which, which blockchain. Block, which blockchains will be there, uh, will, will they use? Oh, we're Polygon, um, Polygon. is launching a ZK VM. Mm -hmm. um, most of the layer twos using ZK rollups to roll mm -hmm. into Ethereum. Mm -hmm. um, ZK Sync announced ZK Era, a new blockchain that's uh, ZK VM based. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're going to see a lot of... Um, 
um, ZK proof and ZK rollout. How do you think, how, how this will, will correspond to the uh, pre present day regulations? Because present day regulations, AML regulations, they require um, the obliged entity to have all the information. So they, it's not enough to have just like answers from, for, for questions. That's, that's where, that's where on-chain, off-chain uh, will probably come into play. So you can have pseudonymous data on-chain, and mm -hmm. then you have something that will tie that to your private off-chain database or systems that you Yes, address. but this, is, this does not respond to the, the problem that we have, that, um, uh, <laughs> that, that like any ob obliged entity has to, co to, has to collect the, the copy of the passport, uh, you know, uh, proof of source of funds, proof of address, and uh, these ZK things, they are good, but they uh, do not mean the same thing. So you don't, you don't well, get... Those things that are PIIs, yes, private PIIs, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, personal identifiable information, they will continue to exist, right? Mm -hmm. And you, as an as a obliged company, as you said, will continue, continue to have the, uh, the relationship. What I'm saying is that you don't need to have that on-chain. You have to do the work regardless. You're yes. going to have to record that on your own off-chain systems. Yes. But that data, preferably, shouldn't be on chain to avoid the misassociation uh, between a private identifiable information yes. and a public and a public key. But the, the, the problem is that uh, most of the businesses that we are talking about, they are only on chain. They don't have off chain uh, parts. Yeah. Then, then, <laughs> then once we are all on chain, one hundred percent, then yeah. they can they, they can be. And, but and we're in a transitory period, right? right. There will be off chain. Uh, for as long as you know, at least I'm, I'm alive, there will be off-chain, uh, off-chain data, off-chain businesses as well. So. Well, yeah, I mean, hotels and, <laughs> and and firms that are providing us this space, for example. <laughs> <laughs> the last question um, for our audience that are managing right now fintechs, uh, cryptocurrency exchanges, uh, and one of the questions that they always come up with is where to um, to set up the, uh, the headquarters and how to be regulated uh, in the best way right now because we see let's say an example of FTX that we're trying they're trying to be regulated in, in the Bahamas then we have let's say overly regulated Coinbase for example we, you ha we have Binance which does not have kind of like headquarters in real life and it's hard to to to, yeah, to explain CZ where they are the headquarter the CZ CZ where the CZ CZ is is the, the headquarter and so uh, headquarters yes so um, what would be your uh, as a strategy director what would be your uh, suggestion or advice here so I, I think you can approach this in two ways right mm -hmm. you can be uh, very much uh, against the existing status quo and say, I'm not going to comply to anything. Mm -hmm. Decentralization is my motto. I'm mm -hmm. going to honor that, you know, whatever we do. And then mm -hmm. you don't have an entity anywhere. You're just operating, you know, on chain for the mm -hmm. most part. Um, and, and that is okay, mm -hmm. right? But that is a very degen way of tackling mm -hmm. things. We're, we're not all going to be degens. So because I advise mostly traditional financial firms, and not so much, uh, you know, crypto firms. What we usually uh, build is again, where are your customers? So if 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 your customer is in a jurisdiction that is adamantly hostile to crypto, that's mm -hmm. probably not where you're going to start doing things, right? But if you're if you have customers that are interested in solving a particular problem with the aid of a decentralized technology, make sure that that is a, a, a relationship you can have with the regulators. If you're in financial services and you don't have a good relationship with your regulators, you probably shouldn't be in financial services because it's a very regulated uh, uh, market everywhere. And the only way for you to actually get heard and get, you know, to innovate with the regulator is by partnering, is not by fighting against it. Because we're not going to flip, uh, you know, this around and, and have everyone in the world understand they're like oh great it's 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 the degen way now i've been into this since i've been studying this since 2014 and i've been professionally working with blockchain since 2017 and i still uh am unsure when i'm sending a transaction for instance mm -hmm. i will send you know a tiny bit to see if the wallet <laughs> yes. 
Like <laughs> I do all of that stuff yeah. because it's like, it's, we're not there yet. And, and if we don't have a level playing field, it's going to be really, really hard to, to get there. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, I think that that's the role of the regulators. Yes, you have to protect uh, consumers for sure, but you can't do that at the expense of stifling innovation. And, and I think that we're going to build a much better uh, financial services, that it's much more accessible, it's much more uh, equitable and composable, which is probably why I keep studying this. Um, if we do that with decentralized uh, technology. So I think there's a lot to be gained by regulators as well. And fighting the regulators is not going to make them understand. It would be better to have uh, regulators hire people like you, I guess, or like me. There <laughs> are. And, and uh, uh, you would be very surprised, uh, and I've been working with regulators mm. since 2017 in this capacity, is mm. there's very good people um, that mm. are working uh, in the technical layers of, mm. the, of the agencies. Mm. They're just overwhelmed. It's a lot. Mm. And uh, I was joking the other day with a friend who works at a regulator and mm. I wouldn't want to be in your skin right now <laughs> because it's, it's, it's really hard. I mean, mm. imagine you have to um, organize a whole decision across the weekend because one of your firms has gone, you know, belly up and, yeah. and, and that could be, you know, contagious to the rest of your market. Yeah. Like, it's a lot of pressure for the regulators as well. So um, you, you, you can quote me saying that I wouldn't want to be on their skin because it's a, it's a tough job. And, 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 I don't, and I don't feel, uh, especially in, in, you know, at least in my experience, I don't feel that uh, the uh, people that work at regulators are necessarily um, well acknowledged uh, for the work that they do. So, uh, but yeah, partner with them. I'm, I'm pretty sure they're eager to uh, discuss and debate and, and come up with you know, alternatives. These are mm -hmm. very well educated and they're public servants uh, the, the the one thing that they have in mind is uh, to serve the public good so most of them yeah and so they, they need to, to balance the, the different interests yeah, yeah. it's it's hard imagine like uh, regulators had until I don't know 2012 they had like 140 120 currencies that they Mm. Had to know. Yeah. Now it's twenty thousand. <laughs> like, oh my God, it's, yeah, it's that's overwhelming, right? So uh, you know, if 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 a mm. firm comes to them, say, hey, I'm I'm trading this obscure token from you know, whatever project. Mm -hmm. How can I report on this? And they're like, it's like <laughs> I don't know. It's a complete weird technology with a complete weird monetary policy that they don't understand, and we're all asking. For them to give us guidance, uh, so it's 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 not mm -hmm. a, it's not it's not an easy job. But I I you know for the most part I feel regulators are trying to do the right thing. Um, so we we need better regulators and we mm -hmm. need more of them mm -hmm. to actually you know flesh out whatever whatever has to happen. But if you get like the the uh, you asked about the FCA mm -hmm. last year we had the crypto sprint, which was was a policy uh, sprint with the industry and the regulator to mm -hmm. understand. Okay, so. Is it the registration process? Mm. Is this the oversight process? Is this the reporting? And now, what is what is in the policy world that the regulator can innovate so you guys can have you know a better existence in the market and help foster that while still maintaining control uh, over the you know what is necessary? So I think there is opening, um, and most of the regulators that I work with are very uh, familiar with you know mm -hmm. they're just overwhelmed. It's just a lot. And in, in terms of, let's say, uh, uh, do you see that there is, there is over already existing, let's say, infrastructure, such as, for example, auditing firms, um, uh, what, auditing formats for, for, let's say, for reporting, and et cetera, et cetera. This, is all, this all exists, for example, for the EU FCA um, uh, here in the, in the UK. Uh, I, I know in Brazil it uh, does. They have, like, f the, the registration forms are standard, yeah. everyone that's operating in yeah. the country... Uh, uh, is going through that. I know the FCA has a backlog mm. of licenses that mm. have been requested in the last couple of years. Um, mm. There was a little bit of controversy last year uh, about the quality of the information that was provided by the firms. Mm. Uh, so 
You yeah, know? yeah, in the in the FCA, yeah, yeah they they had this, this report of uh, 2017, 2021, I guess, uh, when they uh, kind of like uh, gathered all the information and they said that all these suspicious activity reports were not really uh, up to par. Well, oh, but you you don't need to go you know too much into crypto. Even payments, uh, the FCA announced a couple of weeks ago that uh, there was like 290 plus mm. companies that are payments companies that mm. have uh, subpar. Uh, AML KYC practices that mm. are going to go going to reviews. Yeah. So I think you know all of that overwhelms the regulator and the supervisors mm. because mm. it's a lot of work, uh, especially when, I think in the UK you have like sixty thousand mm -hmm. financial firms. Like that's a lot. Right? So Huge. yeah, more 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 to come on that end. I think uh, mm. you know, and and that's why I keep saying that the regulators need to leverage decentralized uh, infrastructure for mm -hmm. their own benefit because. Otherwise, if, they, they will not cope. If you think about the way uh, we get financial reports in traditional finance, mm -hmm. it's like between 45 and 60 days post, post fact. Right? Yeah. Here it can be. Uh, and it, you know, there's a lot of, you know, the, the data comes from here, you mm -hmm. reconcile here. You re I mean, I, and mm -hmm. I know this because I, I, I did, uh, you know, my fair chunk of uh, reg reporting in my, mm -hmm. my, own, my own life. Um, and it takes forever and then they consolidate the industry and they're like, mm. you know, some patterns there and they're like, oh, there's maybe a systemic risk here. Um, if you have a you year know, the, data, <laughs> the data on the blockchain, yeah. you can have, you know, analytical engines running all the time with the data that becomes available in the world state. And if something comes up that is, you know, a weird pattern of anything, you can actually do something that is more timely, right? Right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we had uh, Mauricio Magalji. Uh, thanks for watching.